It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck, and welcome once again, everybody, in the front row. I am your host, Mike Vaccaro. As always, behind the scenes is JR Equipment, our creator, producer, and director. We also remind you that this is a CLNS Media Network podcast. Be sure to check out clnsmedia.com for more great shows. And as always, we invite you to like, to share, and to be sure to subscribe to our show as we continue to help grow it and make it even bigger and get you greater guests to hear their stories. Today, our guest in episode number 68, we hear his story, Ron Say, a former All-Star on the Dodgers, a member of the 1981 World Series championship team, tells us about his journey, shares it from Tacoma, Washington, to the minor leagues, to the Dodgers and beyond, and what he's doing now. Has a book coming out right now called Penguin Power, coming out soon, celebrating 50 years of an iconic infield with the Dodgers. We'll talk about that today and much more. Episode 68, it features Ron Say. Uh, again, thank you so much for spending time with us here. We're going to certainly dive into some of the stories that I know are, are in your book uh, that's out this month, Penguin Power, which plays on your nickname that we're going to dive into as well. But for our <laughs> guests, we'd love to get to the, the very beginning, the very start of their athletic career. For you, born in, in Tacoma, Washington, back in the 1948, you grew up there. You're a multi-sport athlete. What sports were you playing leading into your high school days and, and through high school as well? Oh, you know, you know, I, 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 uh, I, essentially I grew up in a boys club. Um, you know, my dad, I think took me over there one day and then, um, pushed me through the front door and I said, I'll be, I'll be back at four o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, I, I formed a lot of, uh, lifelong relationships over there in the early beginning. And I, uh, was really part of, um, you know, growing up, and I had two two guys that were brothers, Tommy Tommy and Eddie Burmester, that I hung out hung a lot around with a lot, and we were, uh, uh, you know, pretty much uh, a, a part of the boys' club building. You know, we we would help open the place. We would uh, take take registrations. We would pass out towels. We would mop the floors. We'd hand out equipment. Uh, play in between time, close the doors at night. Uh, you know, it was a, a kind of a really a special time. And when I was old enough, I could ride my bike. And it was about five miles away. And back then, you know, really, we didn't really have to worry about some of the things they worry about with kids on bikes and walking to school as they do today. Uh, so it was pretty free and open, and it was great. I had a wonderful time doing that. And one of the kids over there, that was part of the boys club when I was growing up was uh, Bobby Moore and that who became a modern shot. Yeah. And we actually played a number of sports uh, together growing up. And then we merged at high school level and played a couple of years there together. But uh, it was a, a, it was a, I played baseball, basketball, and football, and those were my primary sports. I alternated playing those until I finished high school. I played everything. And, you know, mixed in is soccer and, you know, and a lot of stickball, a lot of, a lot of, uh, 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 sock ball, tennis ball, wiffle ball, you name it. I played it. Um, I had, it was, I, I grew up around that. Uh, I started working for my dad when I was 12 years old, worked for 76 union. I was a pump island jockey back then. And I handled all the charge accounts that came through, and uh, passed out a lot of other merchandise in the in the in the in, in the in the, in the in, at the station. And uh, it gave me a sense of responsibility and a job. And I was working six days a week during the summertime, and uh, I would have time off to go practice and play ball and stuff. So you know, I uh, I kind of resented that back then because uh, I didn't really have a chance to spend a lot of time other than playing games with. Uh, kids I was growing up with, but uh, uh, it, it worked. And, uh, you know, then when I uh, eventually had to sign and go off to, to uh, play at Washington State University, I took my baseball scholarship and I was drafted by the Mets back then. And I also had the Vietnam War, which pushed me in the direction of going to school because that's the only protection I had. So that's the, that's the run of it up to uh, 20 years old. Yeah, as you said, you were drafted by the Mets. Were, were you entertaining signing with them at that time, coming out of high school? They, I would have had to have had an offer that I couldn't have refused. 
uh, to, to do that. I already had my scholarship in place. And the key factor in all of this really is the Vietnam War. Uh, if I had signed and played, uh, I would have been classified 1A. Mm -hmm. And 1A back then meant you're going to go to basic training, AIT, and then you're going to Vietnam. And uh, I had some friends that fell into that category that did go over there, and some of them didn't come back. Yeah. So as you said, you, you had the protection of going to Washington State. Were, were you getting recruited elsewhere or were you looking to stay within the state? I mean, it wasn't too far. I mean, it was far from Tacoma to, to Pullman, right? Almost about five hours or so. It, true. Uh, but I had uh, a coach that was recruiting me heavily. Uh, I had some friends there and we had had uh, a, a successful background in sports uh, together. And uh, it ends up, I go over there and I, 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 I pledged the same fraternity house. And it was like an animal house with <laughs> athletics. And uh, I think we had six or seven baseball players. We had three or four football players, including the starting quarterback. Uh, I think we had six of the 12 basketball players. Uh, and we really had a good team because this was the uh, time where the Pac-12 did not have freshman eligibility. Mm -hmm. And this was the time that uh, Lou Alcindor got recruited by John Wooden to go to UCLA. And that's the year that uh, the freshman destroyed the national championship varsity team. <laughs> and uh, so we were all in kind of the same era of stuff. And, and Kareem has been a friend over the years. And so uh, it's it's been a, a crazy time to have been able to uh, take my uh, career and and uh, and live it in Los Angeles. It was, uh, you know, it was right up my alley. Um, you know, it, 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 I wanted to win, they wanted to win, and we won. Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, maybe tough to find some some heroes or guys who inspired you. And I'm reading some excerpts from your book. Uh, you had one that was uh, from a rival uh, rival team, right, that, that would eventually become your rival with the Dodgers. Uh, go ahead and tell me who that is because I have another person in mind. Willie Mays is what, what I'm Oh, thinking. Willie, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. I, I ran right past that. Uh, the, the funny thing about that is, and I just, I just came up with this, you know, uh, yeah, Dodger fans are going to probably take Willie Mays. Well, I wouldn't, you know, he's, you know, come on, man. Well, let, let, let's, uh, let, let's honor both. Uh, if you flip his number 24, it becomes 42 mm -hmm. and that's Jackie Robinson. Yeah. So, uh, I, I don't, I, I, uh, I idolized Willie. I had a hard time trying to do that with my friends because I was kind of a little macho, you know, like, who's your favorite player? Oh, you know, I don't have a favorite player. Uh, <laughs> and I finally said, you know, what are you doing this for? You know, you're, all you're doing is, you know, playing around with yourself. And then finally, when I came to terms with it, I don't know, maybe I was 10 or 11 or 12, you know, I just said, you know, Willie's my man. That's it. I know you guys love Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays, but, you know, I Willie's my guy. And uh, I got a chance to see him because Tacoma was the AAA affiliate of the San Francisco Giants. And when they had an off day one year, they came up and played. So I got to see him play. And that was like, you know, wow, is this really cool? And then as the, uh, the, the as time went on, you know, I got to play against my idol. And we have a relationship. And I, 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 if I would have rem remembered that at the time that we were going to do this podcast, I would have sent you the picture so you could have posted it. But uh, uh, I, uh, th there was a, uh, uh, I think a 60th anniversary that the Giants in San Francisco uh, were, and they were playing the Dodgers in a home game and they wanted some players to come up. They wanted to have a bit of a celebration, 60 years of coming to the West Coast. And um, <clears throat> I had had this picture of Willie and I uh, that I hadn't had signed. And I'm saying and hoping that, you know, hey, is, is, you know, I think Willie's going to be around, you know, when we go up there on the weekend, because I got this picture that I've been holding on to for about 40 years, and I would love to have it signed. And so it just so happens that one of the clubhouse guys that there when I was, was playing uh, got a hold of the message and uh, let Willie know that, hey, you're going to come in. He says, well, I hadn't planned on it. He says, well, Ron Say's coming in. He wants to, you know, he wants to have this picture signed. He wants to spend some time with you. He says, okay. So he says, if he wants me to be there, I'm going to be there. And so when I got to the stadium that morning, he came over 
said, come on, we're going to see Willie. So I went over and, and spent probably 20 minutes with him. He had some care, his, his, his caregiver with him. And uh, we got to spend about 20 minutes and he signed the autograph and uh, we took a picture and talked about old times. And I, I reminded him again that, you know, he was my favorite player and uh, it was just great. I mean, to, there was a time also in uh, when he was finishing his career with the Mets in New York, we were playing in Chase Stadium and Willie was playing this night and he had a home run against us. And he's coming around the bases. And now I've got my glove in front of my face and I'm smiling. And I'm saying, God, I said, I really want to shake his hand. <laughs> you know, and I didn't. But I uh, I, I, said, you know, when you, I don't know if you remember this, but, you know, when you hit a home run against us in Chase Stadium and you were coming around the bases and I was about ready to shake your hand. <laughs> and it's one of those times where, yeah, I'm mean, here, you're playing a professional game, you know, everything matters, it's, you know, high intensity and all this other stuff. And I became a kid again, you know, and uh, relived a, a, you know, flashing past of, you know, watching this guy play when I was a young kid. So it was a big thrill for me. Yeah, baseball certainly does that to to players, to fans as well. It's a, such a romantic type of sport. And for you, maybe you were, you know, that guy for some people when, the, you know, you're at Washington State. As you said, you're on the freshman team, then the varsity team, only one year there. But you had a really good impact, a big impact for uh, your head coach, Chuck Brayton. Uh, do you remember that 1968 season, what you were able to do in the, helping the Cougars go 29-9 and that season? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, pretty much was our leading hitter. Uh I, I I think I you know I, I led I think I led the club in everything you know I triple crown uh, I think I led uh, or I tied uh, for the lead in uh, home runs and conference in the back back eight um, we uh, beat both Stanford and uh, USC uh, who were ranked above us I think the highest we got that year was eight. And at a time where Stanford was kind of one and two, and we actually beat Stanford in Stanford. I hit a home run in the top of the ninth inning to win, beat them. Um, we, we did not have regional tournaments. We did not have uh, uh, any of that uh, uh, playoff stuff. The, the conference champion from the back eight had an automatic berth to the College World Series. And when you have two other teams ranked in the top 10 and they, you know, are probably pretty close to being the same, you know, caliber. And only one team gets to go. Uh, it turns out that, you know, USC and Rod Dato. And they had a star-studded team, too. They had Bill Lee and Jim Barr pitching for them and, uh, and others. And uh, they ended up winning the national championship. So, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a big boost for the conference, a big boost for me, because that was a year that I really felt like uh, – my plan was uh, I, I got to get this done, and uh, I did well enough to uh, be the third third person selected by the Dodgers in 1968 in the uh, secondary draft. And that turns out to be, by the way, the uh, the greatest free agent draft in Major League history based on the success of the other players. We had 11 players, 11 players in one draft make it to the major leagues and have long careers, most of them. Yeah, And the funny thing today about it is you look back and now we've got all these metrics uh, that play into it. And not only did I have the highest war of all of the players that we had go forward, and there's a ton of them, uh, I had the highest war in the entire 1968 draft. So I feel really pretty good about that. Yeah, that's, that certainly got you recognized. As you said, maybe the analytics weren't there at that time, but also during that time, it was your your college coach, Chuck Brayton, who gave you the nickname, the Penguin, right? People think it's Tommy Lasorda, but it's not Lasorda. It's your your college coach at Washington State that gave you that nickname that has lasted all these years long. Right. And uh, I had a nickname in college, from, or excuse me, high school from playing football, was Scooter. And then uh, uh, Bobo, um, after watching me a little bit, uh, coined me the uh, the Penguin. But, you know, the funny thing about it is he didn't call me the Penguin a lot. He just kind of set the standard and called me, the, called me the Penguin. And then, you know, the nickname stuck. And uh, now I've signed and uh, Tom Lasorda says, oh, you're, you're the Penguin. And uh, <laughs> he wants to take credit for it. And as many times as I reminded him that he wasn't uh, the, the, the first one that named me the Penguin, 
he'd still take credit for it. So it didn't matter, uh, but it did. And it turned out to be great. Uh, you know, the fans related to me. It wasn't Ron. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. It was, you know, the Penguin. Here's the Penguin. Penguin coming out on the field. Penguin, can I have your autograph? Penguin, can we have a picture together? You know, and uh, the, the kids loved it. And I love kids. So uh, it, it was, you know, it, it just it fit. We saw your wife there, Fran, in more than 50 years. Does, does she call you the Penguin? Does that stick with her as well? No, she calls me some other things. Uh, that, <laughs> Fondly, however, fondly. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. You know, so for you, again, you go through that system. You go to Albuquerque a couple of times as Double A, then Triple A as well. You finally get the call up uh, in September third, nineteen seventy one. Do you remember your your Major League Baseball debut? Oh yeah. It uh, you know it came as a surprise. Uh, you know I um, with the, the the numbers that I put up in Spokane that year. Uh, which was 328, 32, and 123, which set a new modern-day record for RBIs in the Coast League. And we played, I don't know, maybe 130-some games, roughly. And, uh, you know, today's standards, I would have been called up at half, uh, mid midseason. And so I had to finish it out, and uh, it's getting near. We've got a couple more games at home, and, uh, you know, I uh, am getting married in probably about 10 days in chicago and uh tommy comes in he says uh hey he says uh, can you meet me for lunch tomorrow i you know at lunch at home we never eat lunch at home we always eat lunch on the road he says well i got some things i got to talk to you about and i say well I, I i can't imagine what that's gonna be about. so he brings elton schiller who was the general manager of the spokane indians and uh, along with him to the lunch and we're there and, you know, I'm saying, well, OK, so, I mean, what are we doing? Are we eating? Are we talking or what? <laughs> well, I just want to let you know that you're going to be t you're going to be on an airplane to Los Angeles in a couple of days. I said, well, what for? What am I going to Los Angeles for? And then it's like, you know, it's a late delay. You know, it's like, what? He says, yeah, he says, you're going to you're going to the major list. And. You know, I uh, I got a little teary, just like I'm getting a little teary right now. And, you know, I'm saying, oh, my God. I said, I can't believe this. I really can't. I said, I said, but I'm getting married. I'm getting married in 10 days. And he said, well, not, don't worry about it. We'll, it. It'll get handled. So now I have these two incredibly important things happening in my life. And it's just like, boom, boom. And the boom, boom part of it is like the second one, which is going to get married. Got married at the Drake Hotel in Chicago. And I had pretty much one of those real quick, you know, I love you, let's get it done kind of relationships when we met. And I'm going to get married and I have not met the parents. Oh, wow. I have not met the parents, okay? <laughs> so uh you know i'm you now i've got a lot of anxiety going on and uh you know i ended up showing up you know uh on on september 3rd i remember coming through up on the, where they call, they call the top of the mart it's where the big logo of dodger stadium is mm -hmm. i took the elevators down i finally got to the clubhouse and then i ran into all my guys and uh you know i you know uh, go out on the field and i'm starting you know, starting with some of the pregame workouts. And, you know, one of the first things I look up is that big logo at the top, you know, because Dodger Stadium is kind of a sunken diamond, if you will. And <laughs> I'm saying this is just too cool. And so now I'm still a little anxious. I get to all the pregame stuff done. And now I can't wait for the, uh, the national anthem to be over with because now it's official. You know, I, I'm playing my first game in the major leagues. The national anthem's over with. So as soon as that national anthem is over with, I run up in the tunnel and I start pounding on the walls. And I'm saying, you know, I finally got here. I finally got here. And, you know, I didn't play much. I uh, got a couple of pinch hit bats. Uh, they were in a pennant race. Uh, as it turned out, uh, they battled back and uh, ended up losing the, 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 the uh, division by one game. And so all of us guys that were young there just kind of sat back. And we also had Dick Allen, who was a kick in the pants uh, on the club at that time. And uh, so it was a, a great beginning. And then, uh, 
you know, I, I went off to Chicago. I got married. I dropped my wife off in Scottsdale. She was going to grad school uh, uh, in social work at ASU and uh, caught a plane, went to San Francisco. And then I had my other relatives on the other end of San Francisco, uh, joined them on the road. So uh, Fran would come in on alternate weekends that we would be, you know, home, uh, mm-hmm. not on the road. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was the start of, uh, you know, my, my uh, brief cup of coffee and have an experience there. And, uh, you know, as time would tell, you know, it turned out to be a long career. So that was the, uh, that, that was a, a, an incredible uh, short period of time that I went through that was uh, uh, very meaningful to me. Yeah, obviously. as you said, a couple of games there in 71, 11 games in 72, but then I, I'm assuming you broke camp in 73 and you knew – you were on this team in, in, in June 23rd, the 50th anniversary coming up, I guess. Walter Alston, right. he, he, he put you guys all together, that infield that played together for eight and a half years. Steve Garvey at first base, Davey Lopes at second base, Bill Russell, the shortstop, and you at third base. Did you guys break camp, break the spring training thinking, okay, this was going to come together and this was going to last as long as it did? Uh, no, actually, we had no understanding of that whatsoever. Um you know, Davey and I were, uh, were were still trying to, you know, secure that starting position, uh, even though it was theirs and ours in, in a short time. Um, uh, Bill Russell had been converted along with with, uh, with Davey from uh, being outfielders because of their athleticism and because of their speed. And, uh, you know, we had two of the fastest short-term, long-term guys in the middle of the infield. So they, they, they were... They did a terrific job. Monty Baskell was the one who took them under his arms and uh, and worked extremely hard to make that transition possible. Uh, Garvey f- was out of place. Uh, he wasn't able to play third base. He wasn't. They tried to put him in left field, and Von Joshua was out there. And Von was a kid that played with us in Albuquerque. That you know led the Pacific Coast League in hitting and left-handed hitter with speed. And, you know, he was destined to play. And so was Tom Shoring. And so there was a lot of, you know, battling for spots out there. And, you know, Garvey had a bat as such that, you know, needed to play somewhere. And if you remember growing up, you know, they said, if you can hit, we'll find a place for you. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, Bill Buckner was playing first base at the time. And because of Bill's athleticism, uh, they went to him and asked him if he thought he could go back out and play left field because they were trying to give, you know, Garvey the spot uh, someplace. And if you've been in baseball long enough and it goes back a long time, you know, first base is is where they put guys that you're busy over there, but it's not the most difficult. All due respect to first baseman in baseball, it's not about that. But you know that when you become a little bit older, the best place to put you is either over first base or send you over to the DH uh, in, in the American League. And now we have a DH in National League, so that, you know, that, that care of itself, too. But that's where people go. And uh, you saw it happen with Paul Molitor. You saw it happen with David Ortiz. Uh, you know, they, 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 they played some, some infield, they played some first base, and then they went to the DH. And in the, with the DH part of it, uh, if, if <laughs> you pretty much have to be the best player, best hitter on the team that's not playing. So they had to find a place for him, and then he settled in at first base. And uh, uh, although there were some issues there with his arm, uh, you know, he, he got the job done. Yeah, and, and again, you guys were together for eight and a half years. During that time, it kind of led toward 1981. Let's talk about 1981 a little bit because it was kind of a strange year. Obviously, it finishes with a World Series championship for you, but a strike right in the middle of the season – what was that like as a player to to deal with that? And, and, and what were you doing during almost a month off in the middle of the season? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we were now a couple months into the season, and it looked like there you know, you know, was going to be a big issue with uh, uh, moving forward. And so the only thing that we could do is concentrate on what we were doing. And we said, look, um, uh, we we always have the intent to win uh winners move forward uh there wasn't wild card teams back then there wasn't there was only two divisions east and west a five game series not a seven 
Uh, so we just said that let's just continue with what we what we know. We want to be in first place. That's what we're playing for. So let's be in first place when this thing breaks. Now, Cincinnati was hot on our trail. Uh, they finished a half a game behind us. But when things were now shut down, you know, we were in first place where we wanted to be. And so we had no idea what was going to happen in between time. So we worked diligently. We went to USC almost daily uh, and used the field and took batting practice. But after about the month, a uh, month of that, it got real stale. You know, uh, guys, we started, you know, getting, I think, you know, we started cutting things short. And like, I, you know, I, I don't want to drive another hour down here to take a few balls and, and we have, it's not, it's not competitive. We're just going through the motions, you know, let's take a few days off, kind of, you know, clear these cobwebs out because we weren't real confident. And, uh, we eventually resumed in a few days, uh, but we didn't uh, go after it as hard as we did in the beginning. Because, you know, you, you have no idea. It might be over in five days, might be over in two weeks. So we wanted to stay on top of it. So the longer it lasted, the, the less enthusiastic we got. And um, finally, you know, there was word that, you know, hey, you know, uh, this might be over with pretty soon. So now we're back on this daily regimen again, trying to get prepared. We're confident from Marvin Miller and the notes that we're getting from the feedback are are positive we're going to have something done here pretty soon and so and it ha happened and it turns out they made uh, a decision about the first half and the second half championship and so since we won you know we we got an automatic berth to yeah. the playoffs and so the pressure's off of us and all the other divisional winners which is only three but uh two american and two national and so now the pressure really kind of mounts back to uh the other teams that now get a second opportunity, you know, because if they win the second half, then we're going to play against them three game series. I think it was and, uh, and move forward. And so, you know, wow. Okay. We can, we don't have to come out, you know, pressing all cylinders at the beginning and, uh, you know, our overall record the second half, uh, wasn't as good because we didn't have to play under pressure. And so uh, we, we tried to get to that point, uh, but it's tough uh, you know, knowing how this is all going to come down. And uh, we were we did as, as best we could. And but I missed the, the the last month of September as well, because I got hit by a pitch uh, by Tom Griffin of the uh, San Francisco Giants and uh, missed the last part of the season, last month of the season. And uh, I wasn't clear whether or not I'd be able to come back and play. And uh, so I, I did. I missed the first three game series and we were down 2-0 in the first series. So uh, we were able to come back and pull it out. And then when we played the Montreal Expos in the next round, the National League Championship Series, I was ready to go. And of course, uh, as it turned out, you know, we had a huge uh, game turning uh, a home run from Rick Monday late in the game and uh, we beat the Montreal Expos in probably 20 degree weather in, in Montreal and uh, next night we're heading to New York and face the Yankees and we right away we fall down uh, two games to none but it didn't seem to bother us because we'd kind of been playing from behind the whole way so uh, it was just another it wasn't just another day at the job but we it didn't it didn't upset us so much. We we played we played pretty well, um, and, but we had a positive frame of mind about us. We were going home, and then as it turned out, you know, we were uh, uh, we won the last four games. We swept them. Uh, I did get hit in the head in game five by Goose Gossage, and under today's protocol, I would have been out of the rest of the series. And if that had happened, it would have hurt. That would have hurt a lot worse than getting hit in the head by Goose Gossage. Yeah, I remember as a kid seeing the bandage on your head. I didn't realize until prepping for this. You came oh, right yeah. back. It was that was game five. You came back game six. So you know, different time, right? In the, the 1980s for all sports. Well, well, you know, I, I, for, there was a few things that happened. Fortunately, uh, you know, I had a big old ice turban on my head, 
uh, and and Goose and Bob Lemon, manager of the Yankees, came over to our clubhouse in the training room to check on me, and I was grateful for that. And I had had a relationship with with Goose of playing with him in winter ball, uh, against him in winter ball in Puerto Rico. So I, I didn't think there was any intent there. A lot of people wanted to, you know, add a little bit more to that than there's sure. necessary. Uh, and then I went to Sentinel hospital and I got checked out. I had uh, you know, an MRI and a CAT scan and whatever else was going on. It took quite a while to get through that because they had to do a double test. And one of those, they injected a dye into me, a dye into the, 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 the my system, and it would track the uh, apparently the uh, the way that they were able to monitor what was going on a little bit better if they missed anything. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, I I I had to go back the next morning, get clearance uh, to fly to New York, and uh, it was up to me. And so it was up to me that I'm going. Yeah. And so I didn't get into New York till about two in the morning. And we were scheduled to play that next night, and we had a weather delay, which was extremely helpful because I wasn't in great shape at that point in time. I was having busy spells and had a protocol to go through. And uh, so after we had the one game delay, one day delay, I went to Yankee Stadium early, and uh, I actually took a cab ride through Central Park. And I said, "Take your time driving through here. I really kind of have to just, you know." soothe my mind and kind of get things together and then i had another protocol to go through when i got to yankee stadium and um lasorda was following me around like my dog does he was a <laughs> shadow dog and he says how you feeling how you feeling how you doing I, and i said I, i'm doing okay I'm, I'm doing okay and please leave me alone <laughs> and uh he showed me the lineup and he had the fourth spot open and you know it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i can see that the fourth spot open that means that i'm hitting there if i'm playing and uh so we're good so let me do the rest of it so i had now i did not wear a flap on my helmet so i had to get another helmet and i had to go and test this thing because it's just a little bit differently so uh I got through all of that. There were a lot of reporters uh, uh, in, in our clubhouse and Yankee Stadium. If you've ever been in the visiting clubhouse in Yankee Stadium, uh, it's not one of those lush luxury uh, clubhouses. It was, you know, it's, it was, you know, you had pipes running through the top of the <laughs> everything. It was crazy, and it was cold. And uh, there's a lot of uh, writers in there, and I just popped through the door, and I gave him the thumbs up, and he writes my name in the lineup, and then we go out and play. And uh, the fortunate part about it is that, um, you know, I wasn't facing a hard-throwing right-hander that night. I was facing Tommy John. And so, you know, uh, early in the count, I hit a line drive to left field, a one-hop in front of Dave Winfield, and uh, that got us going. I started to feel comfortable. Uh, then I think it was the my third time up, hit a ball back up the middle. It took kind of a funny hop. Gets by Willie Randolph and into center field, and that breaks the game open. And then Dusty Baker gets a little bit of a up back liner to right field that I go first to third on, and that's when I started to get dizzy. And then Guerrero hits a triple to the gap in left center, and that widens the gap. And now I go out to play this half inning in defense, and the last out of the inning, I believe, um, uh, Larry Melbourne hits a little humpback liner to me, and it came at me like a fuzzy tennis ball. Wow. So I went back in. And I said, Tommy, I said, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm having some issues, and I, it's a good idea for you to take me out. I don't want to mess this up. And worst case scenario, uh, you know, I, I can come back and play tomorrow. And so we ended up winning the night game nine to two, and uh, uh, we we eventually take now this long-awaited world championship that the infield has been certainly sitting on for uh, basically ten years, and uh, finally bring it home. And you know it was the last, it would be the last game that the infield would play together. Uh, and the interesting other aspect of that is the first hitters, the first four hitters in the lineup that night were the infield and so that's a significant part of it too that uh, uh it was it's just there were so many things that 
unknowingly fell in place at that yeah. point. You know, and uh, and to be honest, I'm not going to tell you that we were the greatest infield of all time, but statistically, factually, um, uh, we we were the most successful infield in major league history. Did you guys feel the pressure that that this has to be the year? Did, did, you, did you know uh, that it was going to be kind of the end of the era, the end of the four of you together? We we had heard all these things that you're not supposed to hear that are coming down through the cracks from the main office uh, upstairs down to the clubhouse, you know, like this could be it. And, you know, we had a similar situation happen that was, you know, all about us too. You know, 10 years prior, you know, now you have this new influx of players. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it was time. The minor, minor league system was ready to go. I mean, we were polished and ready. Our first year, we won 95 games. Next year, we won 102. And uh, so we were ready. We were knocking on the door. They just had to make room for us. And this same thing now was becoming, you know, part of a repeated. You, you realize how many people that were in our minor league system that never had an opportunity to play in the infield? I mean, we pretty much shut the door. Yeah. Uh, and and so these people had to go other places. But there was also a group in there that, that had uh, Alejandro Pena. They had Mike Marshall, the hitter. They had Greg Brock, who was going to be the heir apparent for Garvey's spot. They had Steve Sachs, heir apparent to Davy Lopes. Uh, Pedro Guerrero had already come onto the scene. Uh, Dave Anderson was another big prospect that was going to play for, uh, shortstop. Um, uh, you know, so they were knocking on the door. And, uh, you know, pretty much Dodger history as far as deals and trades and whatever, they kind of felt like um, – it may be early in most people's minds, but once you get to about 35 years old, this is where they felt like, you know, they needed to weed it out. And we're sitting on age 35. Yeah. And uh, so it was a, a logical move. Um, but um, I remember, you know, uh, coming home from New York and we now have a big downtown parade. And we end up settling in, in at uh, uh, City Hall. And I had an opportunity to speak, uh, as did a few others. But um, right around on the float, downtown Los Angeles, <laughs> you know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people that were there. But uh, I, I, it, it, it's one of those things I won't ever forget. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Like I said, uh, it, it was a long time coming. You guys were able to do that uh, with not just an in infield, but as you said, Dusty Baker. You had uh, Mike Sosha, Steve Yeager, who you were co-MVP with Steve Yeager and Pedro Guerrero as well, which is a rarity to have three MVPs. Uh, and again, you go back and mention that you weren't feeling well. Do you remember the celebration? Do you remember all that winning the, the World Series? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that's uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, Bowie Kuhn was there. Uh, 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 Peter O'Malley was at the uh, the, the 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 pulpit too, and and uh, along with Lasorda, and I think Don Drysdale was uh, one of the uh, uh, voices on the on the uh, broadcast. Uh, uh, they had uh, 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 called Steve Garvey by mistake, and uh, I was you know a little curious about how that happened. Yeager, uh, they said, no, no, it's Steve Yeager. So now we're all up there. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, um, everybody got to share in this, you know, in a different way. Yeah. And uh, even the guys who may not have had, you know, their best year in 1981, uh, when you win as a group, you know, everybody's happy. You know, uh, we, we got things done. Uh, there are times I'm sure you've had other people come on and say, you know, it's kind of tough in the clubhouse when you go five for five and you lose 10 to nothing. You know, you're really thrilled with your performance, uh, but you really have to channel that down because we lost. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's hard. And it, the same goes in reverse. You know, you, you go out there and, you know, you may have one of those nights where you just have, you know, n make no contribution offensively. You know, and everybody else has got one or two hits and an RPI and a couple of runs scored and you win 10 to nothing. You don't do anything. But you you have to understand that, you know, we're all, we're all working together. So you have to say, you know, hey, nice game, nice going, you know, all this other stuff. Uh, the, the bond that you build in the clubhouse, everybody knows that, you know, uh, it could be a different guy, you know, each night. And when you have a good club, 
you know, happens a lot. And so, uh, you know, sometimes it's not your night. Uh, sometimes it's not your year. But if the team is winning, uh, you, you can manage that a lot better. When, you, when you're not playing well and the team is not playing well, it's a nightmare. Yeah. You know, going into the last two se- last two months of the season, if you if you have no chance of getting to the playoffs, uh, I only had to experience that one time. And I got to tell you, I don't, I don't want to go back to that spot. You know, I want to have something to play for when there's two weeks in September. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Major League Baseball is a grind. Minor League Baseball a grind as well. As you said, to have something to play for at the end is a, is a plus. So, again, 81, at the end of an era there, you, you're there until, through 82 and then – uh, you get traded to the Cubs uh, right. there with the Cubs, 83 to 86. You came up with the Dodgers, came up to the farm system. You were a Dodger through and through. What was that like, that transition you had to make in the business side of it, going from the Dodgers to the Cubs? Difficult, very difficult. Uh, actually, my relationship with Peter O'Malley has been nothing but, you know, uh, first class and uh, over the years. And he actually was the one who wrote the forward to my book. And I, I spoke with him just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, um, and, and so uh, Peter and I got together and we uh, had, a, had a conversation. And he convinced me that uh, he would do everything possible to make the transition easy. Uh, but he felt that uh, between Al and Tommy, they had to honor this new group who was coming in. And that's the philosophy that they had. Um, he says, I don't want you to be here and not be playing like you normally do. Uh, you'll play a lot, I'm sure, but it may not be every day. So they want to institute this new thing that they've got going. And he said, it'd really be in your best interest and I'll help you as much as I can. So I understood that, you know, and uh, uh, so what happened was, is that uh, uh, Dallas Green, uh, who was now the general manager coming to Philadelphia for the Chicago Cubs, and we had a new ownership in the Tribune Company, um, was pursuing me. And uh, eventually what they did is they tore up the uh, last year of my contract and treated me like a free agent. So uh, that helped a lot. And we also rolled the dice a little bit with some of the things that Dallas wanted to incorporate in this contract. And um, I trusted him. Um, he ended up uh, uh, asking for help with things. He called me when there was an opportunity for us to get our hands on Rick Sutcliffe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he called me when there was an opportunity to pick up Davy Lopes. And uh, I gave my opinion on both. And uh, I gave him the thumbs up on Sutcliffe. So uh, Rick made me look really good on this one. Uh, He comes over and goes 16 and one in less than five months, I think. And he wins the Cy Young. We win the divisional title. Sandberg is the most valuable player in the league. And I lead the club in home runs and RBIs. So, for us to now, in a very short court period of time, of which Dallas Green promised me that he was going to make moves and he was going to try to make this, he was going to build this thing fast. And he also picked up Dennis Eckersley, and he was one of our starters as well. So we were uh, <clears throat> we were fine tuning this this uh, Cub machine in a hurry, and uh, um. The 84 team had Jody Davis behind the plate, Leon Durham first, Sandberg second, Larry Boa, all-star caliber, longtime friend, shortstop. Third base was mine. Keith Moreland, Gary Matthews, Bobby Dernier, all Phillies that came from Dallas when he came over. And we had other pitchers that were from the Philly organization. I think Tim Stoddard and Warren Brewstar. And we had Lee Smith in the bullpen. And so we had a really good club, and the and the, and the Mets had a really good club too. Uh, you know, they had Carter, Strawberry, Hernandez, Doc Gooden, Bobby Ojeda, uh, uh, Sid Fernandez. Uh, you know, a lot, lot of good players, and uh, Mookie Wilson. Uh, and you know, we fought them off, and uh, then we lose that heartbreaking uh, five-game series 
to San Diego and, uh, you know, Cub fan, you know, had to suffer a little further. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's a great year in, in 84 for you. You you know got some votes for MVP that year as well, finished 17th in the MVP voting, and, and a good run with Chicago. You finished up with the A's. You talked about your first game, your first at-bat. Do you remember your, your last game, your last at-bat with the A's? Well, I did this first thing. I did the first – I did the same thing I did my first at-bat. I struck out. And, uh, you know, I remember Walter Alston. Uh, uh, Walter, Walter never uh, never got a hit. In his major league career, which shortened up, Tommy Lasorda never won a game in the major leagues, which, you know, and so now I'm going to Oakland and I've got Tony Larusa, who did not have anything other than a journeyman's, you know, career in the major leagues. And uh, all these guys had something in common, even though their personalities were all different, uh, which is they had patience, you know, and I, and I think that's one thing that. You know, maybe a manager that didn't have a stellar career or an all-star caliber career or a Hall of Fame career. Uh, because I've seen some of these ma managers who have these high credentials, uh, they kind of expect you to be nothing less than something right behind what they did. Sure. And so when they see people struggle, they have a hard time trying to figure out why that's happening. But uh, I, I was very fortunate. You know, I got tutored in, a, in, a, in an organization that was all about winning. Uh, we had a great time there. We had a, an incredible owner in the O'Malley family. Um, it was uh, uh, essentially a dream come true. You know, I got to play for uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers, one of the richest in history, history and tradition teams in, in all of baseball. Of course, the Yankees are still and always will be number one. Uh, we could live another 100 years and still with the accomplishments of what the Yankee organization has been able to do, we can't catch them. You know, they're too far ahead. But uh, when you talk about the rest of it, you know, I, I really do believe that, and I have to add the St. Louis Cardinals because their history and traditions are just ours, and they've won more championships than they have. Well, for you individually, 17 years, over 2,000 games, almost 2,000 hits, over 300 home runs. Uh, you're an all-star six times. That's six consecutive years as well. When you look at that, and I know in your book you talk about Hall of Fame and the lack of third baseman in the Hall of Fame. Do you feel like your credentials are good enough to be in there? Do you think you'll be in there at some point? Uh, no, I don't. Um, uh, the Hall of Fame voting uh, actually – uh, was very unkind to me. Uh, I didn't even qualify to go past the first year. And uh, I can give you a, one statistic. If you go through uh, and look at the uh, career averages of Ron Santo and myself, who I was compared with when I was a young player, and we both wore number 10, and we both played third base, and we were both from the state of Washington, and um, we both played for the Cubs, and we were friends, and if you take the names away from the stats over 162 games, you, they're interchangeable. And Ron Santo was elected to the Hall of Fame posthumously. I will never know if that will ever happen. <laughs> but when you look at uh, the metrics today, um, something's wrong with the amount of credit that I got. Now, when you look at the metrics and you look at war, I don't think anybody's really done a study of this very well. You know, I am probably just outside the top 10 in war in all time third baseman. Uh, I got zero credit. Uh, I got zero. Ted Simmons, who was elected by the committee here, was also kind of in the same category. He was out, I think, after the first round or second round. And now all of a sudden, after all this time, uh, he's reconsidered. And congratulations, to Ted Simmons. I, was, uh, I, I love playing against this guy. Uh, he could have played on my team anytime. My war is higher than his. And I can tell you that six of the, six of the 10 years that I played here, Sorry about that. Uh, uh, I was the number one ranked team on player, player on my team. And the other years that I wasn't, I was second, third, and fourth twice. 
court twice comes at my rookie year and my final year. And the people who wanted in between were Willie Crawford, Jimmy Wynn, Reggie Smith, and Pedro Guerrero. And really, uh, okay, uh, I am the number one ranked by war infielder in Los Angeles Dodger history. And on the Brooklyn side of it, uh, I'm number three behind Kiwi Reese and Jackie Robinson. And the all-time Dodger team in the infield is Campanella, Hodges, Robinson, Reese, and me. And on the L.A. Dodger side of it, it's Piazza, Harvey, Lopes, Maury Wills, and myself. I'm the only one that's in both. So all I'm asking is, is that how did I all of a sudden just disappear uh, from this? And if the committee is going to take a look, I think I have a fair, fair chance of maybe being considered. But as far as getting into the Hall of Fame, I think it's... Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really feel that I was a Hall of Fame player. Yeah. Uh, you know, the only the one percentile gets to be there. And, you know, there, there are certain things that, you know, you had in the past to gauge your performance. You had 500 home runs, you had 3000 hits, maybe a lifetime batting average of 300 and pitchers were, you know, pretty much 300 wins. And a lot of those things, you know, on the hitting side of it, we've got more 500 home run hitters. We don't have as many 300 hitters. Uh, we we may not have another person that gets 3,000 hits. We're not going to have another pitcher that's going to win 300 games. Right. So are you going to now switch that to make it more feasible for a pitcher to, because the metrics of games on this, they don't value wins. You know, you, you, you're, a, you're a pitcher that goes five innings. You may have a one nothing lead, but you're probably coming out. Right? And so, and you may not pick up the win. Um, I owe if I'm a pitcher in still in today's game, I, I want that W next to my game. You know, I, I want that. Um, but things have changed. So maybe you drop it down to 250 wins. I don't know. But uh there has to be an adjustment here. And uh look, I'm not begging to get into the Hall of Fame. Um uh it, it's just a point of of you know, I, I have a hard time trying to understand how I just got overlooked to a point where it's like how 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 did how did you miss this? And since the metrics are out there, uh, how is it that uh, I'm focused on this? Because it does need a second look. I don't know if it'll be enough, uh, but at this point, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know how much there is to fight for. Yeah, he wrote this book, Penguin Power, but he also have your own podcast, right? What, tell us a little bit about that and and how people can follow that and and, and what you're doing in that space. Uh, well, we, we uh, currently have a studio at CRN Talk Radio uh, here in Chatsworth in the San Fernando Valley, and uh, we're 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 on Roku, Spotify, Amazon, uh, others. Uh, we it's an eclectic show. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, obviously sports uh, personalities. Uh, the 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 biggest one that I think we're going to have uh, at this moment comes up next week with Billy Jean King. And I'm really thrilled about that yeah. because uh, uh, Billy Jean uh, is a minority owner with the Dodgers as well, and a part of LBG, LBGQT plus. <laughs> you know, that's a long thing to have to say, but uh, uh, lots of things going on. Uh, she was in Paris, uh, maybe still be in Paris for the French Open. I can't imagine, you know, being that kind of an ambassador that gets invited to all these Grand Slam events and you got no time for yourself, I imagine, you know, flying all over the world. I suppose it's really exciting, but I know that she's tiring a little bit with that, but uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to have her on. It's more, uh, uh, I just did a podcast the other day and it was a roundtable discussion. And uh, it's kind of one of those free for alls, you know, uh, I have my, uh, um, my co my co producer uh, and, and uh, my uh, uh, my right hand man right now Mike Gary, who uh, I kind of say okay let's go let's just feed me some stuff let's go and see where it goes and it's always really interesting the path that takes you down and, and normally we have a uh, a guest it could be Zoom or in studio depending on their location and and what they want to do but uh, we had Bob Miller on the uh, Hall of Fame uh, broadcaster for the Kings for so many years. Yeah. 
spent his whole career here. Uh, we had Jaime Harine on earlier. Uh, we've had Ad Myers, Drysdale. We've had Reggie Smith, Eric Carroll, Mike Socha, uh, others. Uh, so we, you know, we're, we're, I want, and I had, and we had, uh, Corey Close, the, the, uh, women's UCLA basketball coach on, I, I want to have a, I don't want to be, uh, uh, pigeonholed into, you know, this is all that they're doing. I, you know, I want to have a diversified group of people that we interview. I, I, I want to have people of color. I want to have women. I want to have, uh, uh, all kinds of things. And we've had a number of comedians, uh, uh, uh on and, uh, um, we had Tom Dreesen, who used to open up for Tom, or uh, uh, Frank Sinatra, who, who was a good friend. Uh, plenty of stories there. So it, it's been fun. Uh, the business side of the podcast. <laughs> the <tough part. laughs> yes, the interviews are the fun part for sure. The stories that, that you get to hear as we're hearing yours here today. Your show is called We'll See About That, the podcast you started last year. And again, Penguin Power is out now through Triumph Books. Uh, written with Ken Gurnick. Uh, what, what more can you tell us uh, about the book and what people can expect if they if they get this book? Where I'm sure it's you know available wherever. It's you- uh, currently uh, out on Amazon right now. There's pre-orders being taken. The launch date is uh, is uh, June 13th. Okay. Uh, and we have some uh, like this interview uh, th- things lined up. Uh, the 14th uh, will be the first book signing uh, at uh, Diesel Bookstores in Santa Monica, California. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that uh, and other interviews that go along with it and uh, just trying to tie things in. Um, uh, some, uh, it, it was ex- exciting to finally come to terms with doing the book uh, because my wife had been after me for years. <laughs> and uh, I had some people that, you know, kind of kept, you know, jabbing me about, you know, finally doing this book. And I'd been reluctant, you know, for a long time. Uh, some people wanted to do, my wife actually wanted to do a book about the infield, and that would have been enormously uh, painstaking, I think, to be able to try and go through all that, because I knew about the amount of time that, that it took just to get mine done, my part. Now you got three other people to interview, so that would have been a heavy chore. Um, but I also, you know, felt like, you know, because today, you know, all you have to Google is Ron Say or Mike Caro and you know, all kinds of stuff comes up there. And I felt like, you know, okay, you know enough. <laughs> but I got, I kept getting prodded. And it finally, you know, enough people say, you know, I really, th- you know, you should, you should, you've got a story to tell. I think there might be a lot of people who might be interested in it. So I reconsidered and uh, I decided to take it on. And I can tell you that when I first began, um, I ran into a predisposition that I wasn't aware of which is my ghostwriter had a bout with cancer mm. and we did it during the the time of, of of the pandemic so we did 20 hours of zoom interviews and we had all this stuff and it got transcribed and it just didn't come out very good and at some point because of his condition we had to shut it down and and i that's when i went after kenny and Kenny has a past. Uh, he was uh, also, you know, one of the beat writers for the Dodgers uh, at the end of my time in Los Angeles. And we've kept a relationship over the years. And uh, he has that knowledge and experience of understanding what the Dodgers are about um, and baseball and knows the names. So it was a, a, a really good fit. And uh, I was able to team up with him and we were able to put it together now the whole project probably took two years uh but uh, i'm very pleased with the work that uh, kenny did uh he was total professional um really did a nice job so i'm very happy that uh you know that we had a relationship that worked uh putting this book together and i hope that the uh our, our reading audience uh, enjoys the book yeah, again, it's Ron Say Penguin Power, and uh, as you said, it's coming out here soon, and, and it ties into the 50th anniversary again of the the coming together of that tremendous infield for eight and a half years. Do you think we'll ever see something like that again, an infield like that play together that long in today's day and age with with free agency? No, uh, the the internal workings are really the, the thing that you know makes it impossible. Uh, it's not to say that four individuals under the right circumstances, couldn't go out and do that. So I, I have to, you know, I have to make sure that people understand that. It's 
not a matter of saying, oh, you guys couldn't play like we could. Uh, but when you talk about, you know, you, you, there's so many things involved. There are four people that have to be pretty much on the same length all the time. You can't, you can't get injured. You have to individually play well. Your team has to play well. Yeah. You have to be, you know, in a, in, a, in a situation with your contract, like, you know, your contracts have to be similar. Uh, they're in, around the same time. There can't be another guy knocking on the door that's better than you are and, uh, you know, coming from somewhere. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's almost an impossible count, uh, thing to achieve uh, because there's so many things that can fall out. And, um, you know, age was also a factor. You know, I think we were separated top end to bottom, you know, maybe by four years. And if it had not been any wider than that, uh, it, it would have been difficult uh, to, to, uh, to keep a younger person out of there. So we had a lot of things working in our favor. We were all individual. Every member of the infield was a multiple time all star. Okay. I mean, it, it, it just was an, an, an amazing creation that, you know, we didn't take time while we were in the moment to appreciate because we were too busy concentrating on things that were essentially more important, which is, you know, winning a world championship. And so we got all this done. And we etched ourselves into the record book. And we do have a, uh, uh, in Cooperstown, we have one of those uh, places where the infield is honored. And I've been in that place. And actually, I did some, we did, we had an event there one year where uh, uh, people would, would would be visiting Cooperstown and the museum. And, and, and I was standing in front of uh, the infield uh case and uh, uh like two down was alan trammell who a couple of years ago just got elected into the hall of fame by the, uh, the committee and so we we were just talking back and forth together and uh, uh while these people are passing and taking pictures and everything but yeah we have a tribute in the hall of fame that we don't have one at dodger stadium we don't have one at dodger stadium well it's me Maybe that's coming, and maybe you individually will be in the Hall of Fame at some point as well. And, uh, uh, that's a, that, I appreciate uh, that. It's a nice comment, but I'm not holding my breath. Um, uh, it, it would be, uh, at this point, I'm, <laughs> it would be uh, uh, something that I'd, uh, it's too far-fetched at this point to even think about. Well, we'll see. We'll see about that. But uh, as a Dodgers fan myself, this has been a treat to to hear your story and again to to reminisce about those uh, those teams uh, in the '80s and win the '81 championship. Ron, I can't thank you enough for for your time today. I wish you the best of luck, not only with the book, the podcast, and whatever is next for you as well. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate you guys reaching out so we could do that. Well, another great story in Ron Say, and our thanks to. Uh, Candice Miller with Triumph Books for helping arrange that sit down with Ron here today. As always, we thank you as well for watching and listening and invite you to subscribe, to share, and to like these episodes. More great guests coming your way soon. We'll see you next time in the front row with Mike DeCaro. Have a great day, everybody.